Welcome everybody to uh, our research seminar. Uh, today with us is Professor Peter Fraser, and I hope I'm pronouncing the surname well. Uh, so Peter is associate professor at uh, Cornell University in uh, School of Operations Research and Information Engineering, and he's also staff data scientist at Uber. Uh, he did his PhD. Um, in 2009, he finished his PhD in operations research department at Princeton University. And uh, uh, his research interests are spanning Bayesian optimization, but also the, the, uh, going into uh, some interesting topics, for example, incentive design uh, for social learning. Uh, I found those, those bits quite interesting. I hope we're going to catch up on these topics uh, later on. Uh, but also uh, working a lot with applications as well, uh, like drug discovery, uh, medicine, uh, biochemistry, and so on. Um, we are very happy to have him here. Uh, please give him a uh, hard time with questions. And uh, with that, I think we can uh, start. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, please do give me a hard time with questions. Uh, yeah, so I very much appreciate the invitation. Uh, this originated, I was going to be in the United Kingdom um, in the spring, but uh, unfortunately, the pandemic came in the way. So I wish I could be there in person, but, um, you know, being being there virtually is uh, maybe not maybe not the same, but still, uh, hopefully, um, I'll be able to tell you about some of the work that we're doing and then also uh, meet with some of you. So I'm going to talk about two things, actually. I'm going to talk about a class of acquisition functions for Bayesian optimization called uh, knowledge gradient methods and uh, try to convince you that these are, are useful and um, that you might want to in investigate them. And I'll give you a pointer uh, to some code that will let you try them out. And then I want to tie them to a research direction that we've been diving into that we call that we call gray box optimization. I saw on your website that you, you talk about white box optimization. Um, so I don't know, we, we may mean the same thing. Um, and this is, I'll be talking about a number of papers that are joint with uh, a number of wonderful collaborators, both PhD students and, uh, and colleagues of mine. So, Bayesian optimization, and, and uh, I'm going to assume um, a fair amount of familiarity with Bayesian optimization, um, although I have a quick intro uh, if there happen to be folks in the audience who are, who are less familiar with it. But Bayesian optimization, you know, is designed for black box optimization, right? So I have an objective function f represented here by this black box that takes some some input, um, it classically it might be a vector, but it could also be, you know, um, some complicated discrete combinatorial object like a neural network architecture or a molecule. And we suppose that this black box produces an output F, scalar valued, and our goal is to find the input that makes the output as small as possible, um, where the challenge is that we, we don't know how the black box works and the black box doesn't produce um, derivatives. The output of the black box is, you know, non-convex. And each time we evaluate the black box, it takes a long time. Um, and potentially there's also noise in the evaluations. Um, so just, uh, you know, really quick, if you if you happen to be less familiar with the area, the, basically the way that these methods work is that I evaluate the objective function f at a at a collection of typically randomly chosen inputs x. I build some kind of probabilistic model over the objective function. Typically, that's a Gaussian process, although it doesn't necessarily have to be a Gaussian process. And then I iterate uh, in the following loop, where I um, I find the input x that maximizes um, some acquisition function that quantifies how useful it would be to evaluate the uh, objective function at x. And that uh, measure of usefulness will depend on the Bayesian posterior distribution on the objective. 
I'll then sample at X, update the posterior, and repeat until I reach some, some stopping condition. Right, and then so this kind of a animation I think will be familiar to quite a few people in the audience where I have um, an objective function that I'm evaluating here without noise with uh, the evaluations pictured as blue circles and I have a fitted a Gaussian process to it and the posterior mean is represented here as a solid red line and I'm building a credible interval uh, and that's represented through, through the dashed red lines. And then in the bottom um, plot, there's the acquisition function, which here I'm showing you expected improvement, which is you know, by far the most widely used acquisition function, really powerful, really useful, um, works really well, right? So I evaluate at the point for which, and here I'm, I, I'm interested in maximizing, I evaluate at the point for which the expected improvement is the largest, update my posterior, recompute the expected improvement, um, again, evaluate at the point for which it's largest, and hopefully in a small number of evaluations, I found a point that is close to, uh, has value, um, uh, close to the value of the global optimum. So this set of methods um, is really, really useful, right? So I'm, and, and uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, folks here are, are quite familiar with a number of these applications. Um, you know, probably most widely used in machine learning for doing you know, neural architecture design, um, you know, and more generally auto ML feature design. Um, at Uber, we're interested in uses also for uh, doing design of user interfaces, design of algorithms, um, design of two-sided markets, where typically the way that we would interrogate the quality of a particular um, input parameter X would be through running an A-B experiment um, or uh, might be running a, an, another type of experiment that we might have available to us. Historically, it's been used quite a bit for engineering design, and I, I've been quite interested in applications in aerospace, designing aircraft wings, designing engines. And another area that I'm particularly excited about for you know, the potential for Bayesian optimization is in drug discovery and in materials design, uh, especially in biomaterials. So all of this is amazing, and you see how different these applications are. Um, a big part of the power of Bayesian optimization is that it models the objective function as a black box, right? You can go at, you can apply it to one thing and uh, turn around and apply it to another thing and basically use the same code for lots of different problems, okay? But I want to make the case today that if you have a problem where the objective function evaluations are really expensive and you just can't justify using Bayesian optimization in the typical way, you know, maybe you're going to need 100 evaluations to do well and each evaluation takes a week, so that's 100 weeks, um, but you don't have two years available to you um, to make a decision. In a situation like that, you want to you want to open up the box, right? You want to treat the problem not as a black box, but as what I call a gray box, um, or people might think of it as a as a clear box or a translucent box, um, or 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 a white box. The main idea, right, is that in addition to seeing the output of the overall objective that I'm seeking to optimize, I see other information associated with. Um, the system that I'm, that I'm trying to improve. So what I want to do is give you a couple of examples and then talk about how the, the knowledge gradient acquisition function enables making high quality um, decisions about where to evaluate uh, in the context of these examples. So and, and, um, the examples kind of will run the range of sort of simple to, to complex. So one example um, that I'm gonna do quite a bit with is Bayesian optimization with derivatives. So here it's, uh, you, can, you can envision the same, the classical Bayesian optimization setting, except when I evaluate at a point, I, uh, I observe the gradient of the objective function at that point um, 
uh, in, in addition to the objective function value, right? And so, you know, if you had a situation like this, you might think about using just a classical gradient ascent, um, but the problem with such a method would be that it wouldn't handle, um, it wouldn't handle multiple global optima very well. So you might wanna still use Bayesian optimization in order to get sample efficiency, uh, but leverage the availability of gradients. Another example is what we call function networks. This image is from um, something that I think a number of people are very interested in the moment is uh, biomanufacturing and especially manufacturing vaccines. So the way that vaccine manufacturing um, often works is that we take living cells, uh, it turns out often these are um, uh, hamster ovaries, uh, cells from, from hamsters, um, and we induce those cells to grow uh, certain proteins. And then uh, the output of basically the kind of the, the cells that have grown these proteins but have grown lots of other stuff is passed into another, pro uh, into another chemical process um, uh, uh, which then purifies it um, and formulates it into a, uh, into a form that can actually be distributed and then um, you know, injected into people in order to produce a, a vaccine response. You could consider this whole thing, this whole sequence of steps to be a, uh, an objective function, um, but the challenge in optimizing that is you know, each evaluation um, where I'm gonna think about modifying the pH and the temperature and um, you know, different uh, parameters that I use in the purification process, uh, a single evaluation of the entire process end to end, you know, takes six months. And that's, you know, if we wanna get vaccines so that we can, um, you know, go back to our offices, uh, we'd like to have it take less time than that. So what we might think about doing is understanding that this overall objective function is actually a sequence of small stages that take inputs, take their own individual inputs, produce outputs, and those outputs go on to the next stage of the, uh, of the manufacturing process. So the idea in gray box optimization of function networks is that we might be able to, um, we might be able to model individual stages in this process, uh, do experiments on individual stages of this process in order to build Gaussian process models of the mapping from um, that stage's inputs into its outputs and then wrap that all together uh, into a, an overall optimization approach. Another example is AutoML. When we're doing AutoML, we're typically you know, doing some, we're often using, for example, stochastic gradient ascent um, or descent in order to you know, train some machine learning model. And what we observe is not just the final test error or final validation error. Uh, we also observe the the you know the, the the training and the validation error through the whole process, and we might be able to 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 leverage those observations. And I call those trace observations. Um, we might be able to leverage those observations in order to. Um, do better inference over the mapping from hyperparameters onto um, validation error. You can also do fancy things like uh, stop a, you know, a, a, a training run for your supervised learning model early. You could think about stopping it and then later restarting it once you decide that actually that was actually a pretty promising um, set of hyperparameters at, at which to evaluate. And you can, so that's kind of how you can manipulate the amount of the number of training epochs. You can also manipulate the amount of um, training data or the amount of uh, validation data, right? So all of these things are stepping outside of the realm of a pure black box and thinking about problem structure, how we can leverage that uh, in order to improve uh, query efficiency. And then the final example that I'll tell you about is something that we call multi-information source optimization, also called multi-fidelity optimization, where I have, uh, we call them information sources. 
So one typically would be the objective function. You can imagine that I'm, um, let's say that I'm optimizing some inventory uh, management policy or some policy for uh, picking parcels from a warehouse um, in order to you know, ship them in an e-commerce sort of uh, setting, right? So you could imagine if you have two different facilities, you could, you could you, let's say that you have 100 facilities around the world, um, you could randomize uh, those facilities into A versus B, use like your control picking policy in the A group, and then some you know, new proposed um, policy for picking, uh, for picking product uh, in the treatment group. And then you, know, you get a, a pairwise A versus B comparison you know, over let's say a two week period, three week period. That's pretty slow. You need to get buy-in from a whole lot of operations people that actually own these warehouses and really don't care about your experiment. Um, it's a pretty hard thing to do, right? But you get a pretty accurate realistic, unbiased answer in terms of the quality of um, this particular set of parameters that's describing um, uh, your control. On the other hand, maybe you have a simulation. The simulation, you know, maybe it takes an hour or, you know, a couple hours um, to run. You don't need to get buy-in from anybody in order to run that simulation. You can run lots of those simulations in parallel, right? So the pro is that it's fast, it's easy. Uh, but the con is that the simulation is not a perfect representation of reality. And so you're getting a biased um, estimate of the quality of a particular intervention. So you face, you know, if you want to use only one as your objective function, you face this trade-off between I can optimize the real accurate thing, but it's going to take me forever, or I can, I can optimize the simulation, but the answer that I'm going to get might be wrong because the objective function is not the real objective function. So the idea in multi-information source optimization is that if we have, uh, we can use both and we can build Gaussian process models um, that uh, quantify the bias in the fast information source and make intelligent decisions about whether to evaluate um, the simulation or the real world at each stage of the optimization process. This also shows up in engineering design, and that's how I first got interested in it, where, for example, I might be designing an aircraft and I can, um, I can build a prototype of that aircraft and put it in a wind tunnel. That's pretty time consuming to do, but gives me a really good quantification of um, airflow over the wing, or I can, um, I can build a computational fluid dynamic simulator and, and simulate that airflow. So these are all, um, you know, fun, uh, useful kind of ways to, to try to solve applied problems um, and to do better than, than you'd be able to do using standard Bayesian optimization. Um, but unfortunately, some of the standard methods that we use in Bayesian optimization don't quite work. So what I wanna do is I wanna explain how expected improvement fails in some of these settings and then talk about how um, you can use knowledge gradient methods uh, instead in order to unlock the full potential of, of gray box uh, base opt. So the example that I want to use to uh, articulate this point is Bayesian optimization with gradients. Okay, so let me, let me remind you how expected improvement would work um, in, in a setting like this. So let me see if I, hmm, it's like hard to Move the mouse. Okay, but um, what you're seeing here is eh, I kind of want to be able to use the mouse. Uh, okay, so what you see over here um, in this part of the image is the uh, the posterior before I might make a measurement. I'm minimizing and the, uh, the, the motivation for expected improvement starts by asking, what is the value of the best point that I've observed? So I'm gonna call that F star, okay? So the loss, if I were to stop right now is, is F star and not do any more evaluations. Expected improvement then asks, well, let's say that I evaluated the objective function at a new point X and I saw a value there of F of X. Well, the overall quality 
of the best point seen will be the minimum of the previous best f star and the new point f of x. So the loss, if we stop after sampling, will just be this quantity here. And then the expected improvement um, quantifies the value of an evaluation at x by the expected difference of those quantities, the expected reduction in loss um, due to sampling, right? And so that can just be written like this, and we call that EI of x. And as we know, it has a nice, um, has a nice closed form. Now, let's, uh, okay, <laughs> let me go back here. So let's say that I evaluate, I have the opportunity to evaluate not just the point, but also the gradient, right? Um, that seems like really useful. It seems like I'm getting a lot more information. We know from classical continuous optimization that evaluating gradients uh, often enables rates of convergence that are much better than if I can't evaluate gradients. So it seems like a really good, like useful thing to be able to know. I can certainly update my posterior uh, with that gradient information, right? Because um, gradient is a linear operator. And if I get uh, the result of a linear operator on a function modeled by a Gaussian process, uh, linear functions and normal random variables play really well together. And so actually I can, I can calculate the posterior really well. So that's not a problem. I'm showing you the posterior that includes that extra information. And you see that it's really much narrower than it was before uh, in the neighborhood of the gradient. But if you think through the thought process behind expected improvement, what you see is that actually, um, even though I got way more information, the reduction in loss due to sampling is unchanged. So if I have a problem where I am observing the gradient, I'm changing my posterior, but the places where I'm sampling are not taking into account the extra value provided by the gradient. And that can cause expected improvement to make bad decisions. So here's an example posterior distribution where I've evaluated both the value and the gradient at three different points here, here, and here. And the posterior has taken those gradient evaluations into account. Expected improvement looks at this point. It's like, wow, that's a lot better. Um, you know, it's like point, um, you know, two better than the previous best. So the expected improvement is largest at this point. Um, but it would probably be better to evaluate here. With the first evaluation, it's very likely that I wouldn't see an improvement over the previous best value. But by observing both the value and the gradient, I would learn a lot about the shape of the objective function in this region. and there's a reasonably high potential that through one evaluation of the gradient and then one subsequent evaluation, I would actually be able to improve much more substantially um, over the previous best uh, uh, than, than, you know, than this kind of very conservative, very exploitative um, evaluation. So what we want to do is articulate how thinking more carefully about our acquisition function can allow us to get much more value out of gradient evaluations and also more broadly uh, get much more value in gray box optimization. So the key idea is to value information by the extent to which it improves our decisions. Okay, and you'll see what I mean. Um, in just a second. So here, the same um, or more or less the same picture as before. Uh, oh, geez, actually, so let's, um, I'm gonna just focus on this part of the figure. So I have a posterior distribution um, on the objective function before I've evaluated anything. What decision would I make about the final solution um, for this optimization problem based on this posterior distribution. Um, I could report as my final solution um, the x value 
that produced this F star. But if this is a low risk um, sort of setting, you know, maybe it's some online ads sort of a setting where it's okay to get a bad answer every once in a while, as long as your average performance is, is really good, then what I would actually do is I would look at the, um, the posterior mean. That's my prediction for the quality, the loss associated with a solution. And I, as my final solution, I would, I would choose the value that minimizes the, uh, the posterior mean, right? So I would choose this point here um, at, one, at close to one. And that would deliver slightly better performance in expectation than um, F star. So I'm gonna call that number, um, the, the value of that solution, the loss associated with that solution, I'm gonna call that mu star, and it's just the minimum of the, uh, of the posterior mean. So let's imagine that I do one more evaluation, not just of the value, but also the gradient, right? So I do the evaluation here, and I'm evaluating the gradient, so the whole posterior changes a lot in the neighbor of where I've evaluated it. So then what solution would I report then under that new posterior? I would go through the same thought process and I would choose the point that minimizes the new posterior mean. I'm calling the, the new posterior mean, I'm calling that mu plus to indicate that it's like some data was added. And uh, the, the minimum of that posterior mean, I'm calling it mu star plus, okay? So the, the value of the information due to sampling is the improvement in the quality of the decision that I made. It's the reduction in the, uh, in the conditional expected loss uh, that resulted from that additional information. Um, so we call that the knowledge gradient. It's the, it's the difference in the value of two different uh, pieces of knowledge. So that's why we call it the knowledge gradient. And um, it can make a big difference valuing information using this new acquisition function instead of expected improvement. So uh, what I want to do is I want to think about um, um, uh, evaluating uh, at this point, okay? And I want to think about the, uh, the difference between the improvement that's used by expected improvement and the like, you know, improvement or reduction in loss that's used by knowledge gradient. And I wanna show you that in this setting where we're doing gradient evaluations, um, those two quantities can be, can be really different from each other. So here is, so the, the two dash uh, blue lines here. So this upper one is um, F star and uh, the lower one is mu star. Those two are, are fairly close to each other um, you know, in this particular example. And then after this evaluation where I observed both the point and its gradient, um, the, the new uh, best point in the way that expected improvement thinks about the world is, is this blue line here. It's just a minimum of F star and F of X. Um, the minimum of the posterior mean, which is the, the, the quantity that knowledge gradient thinks about is much smaller here. It's this mu star plus. And what I'm showing you is on this histogram, um, I'm thinking about different realizations for the measurement of both the value and the gradient. And uh, I'm making a histogram for what the improvement according to KG might be. Um, this should really be mu star plus um, minus mu star uh, versus the uh, improvement according to EI, which is the, you know, um, the difference between this quantity and this quantity. Okay, and in this picture, um, the improvement according to EI is, is pretty small, you know, it's, it's here, uh, whereas the improvement according to KG is much bigger. Right, and so I can show you some other, uh, some other sample paths. So in this sample path, the improvement was actually pretty similar to each other. And um, in this sample path, um, because the gradient here was really big, that told me that the minimum of a, the new posterior mean um, uh, was really small, actually got a huge improvement according to um, the knowledge gradient way of thinking, 
whereas the improvement according to expected improvement um, is, is relatively small. So you see that um, uh, the, not, the histogram for knowledge gradient is way out here. So as a result, um, because a lot of the mass in expected improvement is down here, you know, close to zero, expected improvement will think about the value of evaluating at this point. It'll think that that's pretty small and it will choose to not evaluate there. In, instead, it will, um, you know, do a more exploitative uh, evaluation. Whereas knowledge gradient will say, oh, this is, you know, this is a valuable place to evaluate, um, you know, and, and note that that point is here. It's in the middle of this big uh, unexplored region. And so that's going to push it uh, to explore. Okay. Maybe I'll pause here and just ask, see if there are any questions or anything. Okay, cool. I don't see any, anyone raising uh, their hand. So yeah, you can continue. Okay, great. So conceptually, that's how this works. And that's sort of um, the reason why these acquisition functions work better. I'll show you some, some you know, results from numerical experiments and, and some um, simulations as well to, to sort of uh, give an alternate view on, on that sort of explanation. But how can you actually, you know, how would you actually implement this, right? Like the, the description that I gave for this acquisition function, it requires sampling possible values for the observation. And then for each sampled value, it requires like solving a separate optimization problem. That sounds really um, hard to implement and also sounds like it would take a long time to solve. And then I need to optimize that uh, acquisition function. How do I do that? That sounds really hard. So um, there are a couple different methods for optimizing the knowledge gradient acquisition function. Um, I wanna point your attention to this one that actually I wasn't, I wasn't involved in, um, but folks at Facebook have a Bayesian optimization code called Bowtorch, and they developed this method that they call the one-shot knowledge gradient, and you know it works really well. Um, so what they do is they simulate a bunch of uh, vectors, zi, that have um, normally distributed components, mean zero, variance one. Then just uh, note that the reparameterization trick, really widely used in Bayesian optimization, says that if you want to sample from the posterior on the objective, f, but also the gradient of the objective, um, you know, shown there, you can do that using um, that standard normal random vector z uh, if you multiply it by the by the Cholesky decomposition of the um, of the joint uh, posterior covariance matrix on f and and the gradient of f uh, and then you need to add to it the posterior mean on that vector uh, f uh, gradient of f which is turns out to just be the posterior mean on f um, mu and it should be actually mu this should just be mu there. Um, uh, mu and then the gradient of mu. Um, okay, so that's just a reminder. Then, uh, and, and note that this um, depends on x. It depends on where I'm proposing to sample. Then you could think about the value of the new, of the, of the posterior mean that results from conditioning on these two observations, uh, you can think of that as a function of, you know, where I'm evaluating the posterior mean, where I evaluated, and also uh, this randomness in Z, okay? So uh, I'm defining mu plus of I uh, just to be the posterior mean um, evaluated at a candidate point X of I then the knowledge gradient is basically the, uh, the minimum over all x of i of this quantity, okay? And that defines um, 
the what I call mu star plus um, when I get a realization z of i. Okay, and the thing that would that would maximize the knowledge gradient would be to search over x and um, find the x value that minimized the sum of these things over i, basically where, because the sum over i is really the average of that mu star. And so there's a simple way to write that down as just a single big optimization problem that you can solve on a GPU using PyTorch, uh, um, where basically I simultaneously optimize the point that I'm evaluating and for each of the possible realizations of Z, each of the, they call them fantasies, each of these fantasies, where the, where the minimum of the, of the new posterior mean will be. Okay. Um, yeah, and so that's, they call that one shot knowledge gradient. And you can go to this website and you know, download their package uh, and, get a, you know, a nice kind of implementation of this, which is flexible enough uh, to be able to apply to, you know, specific problems of interest, uh, specific gray box problems of interest. Um, and then, you know, has nice GPU support through PyTorch and uh, leverages automatic differentiation in order to solve that one shot um, optimization problem efficiently. So, what I want to do is, you know, once you put all this together, you get a method for um, doing optimization in these gray box problems that works much better than if you were to just use expected improvement um, out of the box. So here's some examples um, where we're optimizing gradients. So on the left here, um, let me just exit. Yeah. What um, so on the, on the left here, you see the decision, the posterior uh, under the knowledge gradient method and the acquisition function um, under the knowledge gradient method. Uh, and on the right, you see the posterior and the acquisition function under expected improvement. I'm going to start them from the same place. And what you're going to see is that knowledge gradient is much more aggressive um, about exploring uh, than expected improvement, right? So this, this first point, that's the point where uh, the knowledge gradient acquisition function is maximized. So it wants to measure kind of in this, in this region here where, you know, um, it's a big kind of unexplored region. Um, uh, whereas expected improvement wants to evaluate basically right here. Um, you know, that's going to give you a bit of an improvement over the previous best, but you're not really learning anything that's, that's going to be super useful uh, in subsequent evaluations. So I do that evaluation. Um, expected improvement does get a small benefit. Here I'm, the dashed line is the, is the, um, is, is the minimum that has been achieved. Um, knowledge gradient doesn't uh, get, the evaluation doesn't immediately result in an improvement in, in the best found, but it teaches it a lot about what this region looks like, whereas expected improvement you know, um, still has this big unexplored region. And that head start basically um, leads knowledge gradient to be able to find a, a global minimum um, more quickly than an expected improvement because it's exploring more aggressively because it knows that it has these gradient evaluations and that doing so um, is productive. Here are some you know, numerical experiments uh, showing you that indeed this produces a lot of value. The, the knowledge gradient is here um, in blue and I'm showing you the base 10 log of the immediate regret on a collection of different problems. You see you know, fairly significant improvements on some of the problems. Um, on the levy problem, it doesn't work particularly well, but um, you know, so basically it's a method that provides a significant amount of value on um, you know, on a, re on a reasonable range of problems. Here are some results on some auto ML uh, kind of supervised learning, hyperparameter tuning um, sorts of problems where you see similarly um, an improvement in uh, 
in various performance measures um, associated with using the knowledge gradient method. It also actually, you know, provides value when you don't have gradients, um, but when you have noise or you're in uh, more than one dimension. So if, uh, you know, if you have a standard Bayesian optimization problem and you're interested in squeezing out some additional uh, Curie efficiency, um, you know, if the problem is in more than one dimension or is noisy, then uh, it's a good thing uh, to try. The knowledge grading is shown here in pink and we're showing a batch version of the method um, with the batch size indicated in the title. Some more results here. So that's kind of like what the knowledge gradient method is and hopefully giving you some intuition about why it might uh, significantly outperform expected improvement in, you know, in some settings. Uh, in less detail, I just wanna show you uh, that it can, you know, it can be used also in, in other settings. So this is the, the multi-information source optimization problem that I discussed uh, in the beginning of the talk where I'm thinking about a really time-consuming, slow, but accurate objective function that I'd like to optimize. For example, an A-B test in a warehouse. Um, and then I have one or more lower fidelity information sources that are biased, but are faster. So here's the model that we think about. And I, you know, this kind of thing I'm sure uh, is, is, you know, something that, uh, that you folks probably use quite a bit given your expertise in probabilistic modeling. So I'm gonna model the objective function. I'm gonna call it, everything is called an information source. So IS stands for information source. Uh, the objective function, I'm gonna model it with a GP. And then I'm going to assume a bias um, delta I, which is the difference between the objective function and the lower fidelity biased information sources, um, IS, I, where I is, uh, you know, one, two, three, et cetera. Um, and I'm gonna model this bias as a Gaussian process. And so that will allow me to build a joint um, kind of multi-output Gaussian, it's basically a multi-output, uh, multi-task kind of Gaussian process model for the mapping from the input X onto all of the, the outputs from all of the different information sources. And in the figure here, I'm showing you a particular example um, where the objective function here is in black, and then I have two biased um, uh, lower fidelity uh, models here, IS1 and, and IS2. And the thing that you'll notice is that the, the red um, information source is, has like a consistent positive bias. Um, but otherwise, you know, and but the, the magnitude of the positive bias doesn't really change that much with X. Whereas the blue information source has a bias that is uh, kind of, if you were to integrate that bias over the whole domain, um, the kind of the average bias is close to zero, but the bias is significant in, you know, either positive or negative in smaller ranges of X. So if I were somehow able to figure out um, maybe through one or two evaluations of the, of the true objective function and a, a, uh, and, and sort of consistent evalu evaluations of information source one at those two points, if, if I were able to discover that um, information source one kind of had a constant bias, then information source one would be really super useful for optimizing because I could just take the value, subtract off the bias, and that would be a really good estimate um, for the true objective function. It would be, would be much easier uh, to evaluate. And so what we seek from an intelligent uh, acquisition function is to be able to learn that automatically from data and then, um, you know, and then go ahead and, and, and take advantage of that. So here, I just wanna show you, kind of give some intuition for uh, how the kind of like joint multitask Gaussian process behaves. Um, just as like a preliminary for thinking about the acquisition function. So the dots here are points at which I've evaluated a, uh, a given um, information source. And, you know, and then the dashed lines are the posterior mean. And then I'm also showing the posterior on the biases, delta one and delta two. Uh, 
So here I'm gonna do an evaluation of the first information source, it shown in that, in that big red dot. The posterior on information source one changes a lot because I've learned directly about information source one, but I don't have a lot of comparisons with the other information sources uh, to allow me to be able to do uh, a lot of inference over, over the other information sources, but, but you did see the posterior change a bit. Then I'm gonna do a few more evaluations of information source one, and you can see that uh, its posterior, again, changes significantly, and the other, uh, the posterior on the other information sources changes somewhat, um, but, but, but by a smaller magnitude. Here are now some um, evaluations of information source two, right? And so you see, I'm starting to learn more and I'm able to um, narrow both the posterior on information source two and the posterior on the, on, the, uh, on, the tr on the true objective function, right? So I've only evaluated the true objective function at three points, but um, you know, the evaluations of the other information sources has, have really uh, uh, allowed me to get kind of a reasonably good um, understanding of, of what that objective function might look like. Okay, and then finally I can do some evaluations of that um, really expensive uh, information source. So we need to be able to use an acquisition function in this problem to decide not just where to evaluate, but what information source to use. And expecting improvement is not going to be able to make high quality decisions here because uh, if you use it straight out of the box and you say, well, what is the improvement in the uh, objective function associated with an evaluation? Well, if you're not evaluating the real objective, there is no improvement, right? So uh, a literal interpretation of expected improvement would say we should only evaluate the true objective. One can use um, you know, one can use the, you can, you, can, you can ignore that fact and you can calculate the expected improvement for other information sources as if they represented the, um, the, true, uh, the true objective and then use that to decide where to evaluate and then use some other kind of uh, decision rule in order to decide which information source to use. But the problem with that is, imagine that you had an information source that had a really large amount of variance, right? Then the, that, that huge amount of variance is gonna cause that information source to have a large expected improvement. Um, but that's not something that you want, right? The, the, the high variance is, should actually make you less willing to evaluate that information source rather than more willing. And so, uh, you know, if you try to kind of hack EI in order to make it do something reasonable, you end up with these, uh, you end up with a method that is gonna sort of work badly in, um, in at least some situations. Whereas you can just apply the knowledge gradient method directly in this problem and it, you know, and it behaves reasonably. Um, so what I'm showing you is uh, kind of the thinking that goes into that. The, so here I'm maximizing. So the posterior mean on the true objective is this dashed line. So the way that the knowledge gradient thinks is it says, well, what would be the decision that we would make in terms of the final solution um, based on this posterior? Well, it would take the point with the largest posterior mean here, or actually maybe it's here, I don't know. Um, uh, but, but I think it's here, okay? And then the value, the conditional expected value of that solution is mu star. Okay, and then what would happen if I did a, an additional evaluation of this information source at you know, this point? Well, that would change the posterior. Okay, you see that the dashed black line here is different than the dashed black line here. And that's be, even though I didn't evaluate this information source, that's because of this evaluation. And uh, I changed notation a little bit here. This is basically mu star plus um, is the, the height of the maximum of the posterior mean that results from that evaluation, right? And so then we, you know, because, and then we would average this, um, we would average the difference between this quantity and this quantity over different realizations for what we might see 
uh, in that, in, you know, evaluating at this point. And um, that would tell us the usefulness for evaluating information source one, um, you know, at like nine and a half. Okay. So that's the, that's the knowledge gradient um, value. And then we would find the information source in the point that maximizes that quantity. So some examples, uh, one is a inventory management benchmark and another one is a, a collection of um, auto ML problems. So this is a, a yeah, inventory management problem where uh, it's a, sort of a simulation kind of benchmark where a company is selling um, a collection of products and the products are assembled to order. So, uh, you know, each, pr for example, you can imagine a, a computer system or a video game console uh, where um, each product is a subset of eight different components. And to fulfill an order uh, from in stock, uh, components require you just to have all the, all the components um, that, uh, that, co that constitute that product. And so the decisions that you're making are when to place orders for those components um, uh, where you pay a penalty for holding inventory in stock because that takes up space in your, in your warehouse. Um, uh, um, but you also uh, pay money and there's a lag time um, associated with each order that you place because you have to pay money um, to, the, you know, to, the, to the carrier, to the truck basically. Um, and so you, you know, uh, we're basically optimizing parameters inside of a, uh, what's called a continuous review base stock policy, which is like a standard um, kind of class of policies that people use for for doing this kind of inventory management. I don't know, maybe some of your customers um, are sort of in this space and maybe use these kinds of methods. Um, so there are uh, there's an objective function which we treat as um, uh, w for which we're using a simulation that um, takes a long time to run. And then we have two other simulations that have different amounts of, um, you know, kind of stochastic noise, and then also have different bias and have different amounts of cost. And we're comparing um, this knowledge gradient method um, uh, where the results are here in blue against two benchmark methods uh, from the literature for uh, solving these kinds of problems. Um, the green one is basically, you know, it kind of hacks EI to be able to handle this, this type of setting. Um, and, then, and then the other one um, is from a, a fairly well-known paper, this multitask Bayesian optimization paper by, um, from Ryan Adams' group, uh, Swirsky et al. And so you see that, you know, even though we just applied the knowledge gradient framework directly to this problem without really tweaking anything, we still get a significant improvement over these um, over these alternate methods. Uh, you you can also use these ideas for um, auto ML using trace observations, um, sort of leveraging the ability to uh, observe the full trace from your training, to stop early uh, in your training, and then also to restart um, restart your training if you decide that that was a good set of hyperparameters uh, at which to evaluate. So here we're evaluating um, the knowledge gradient method uh, in, a, in, a, in a couple different sort of um, hyperparameter tuning uh, sorts of problems and comparing it against other benchmarks, some of which also leverage the ability to do early stopping. And, uh, and, um, and so what you see is you see a significant, in, in both uh, sequential and in batch settings, and you see a significant improvement um, you know, through this kind of um, through through the use of this acquisition function without really needing to do a lot of tweaking that is you know that is specific to this particular gray box optimization problem. So yeah, just in conclusion, um, expected improvement is great and you know really allows us to derive a lot of value in Bayesian optimization. But if you're interested in using a gray box approach for a particularly challenging or important or high value problem, then, you know, expected improvement nine, might not work out of the box for you. And you, you may end up finding yourself with needing to do a lot of tweaking um, in order to make it perform well. Whereas a different approach would be to use the knowledge gradient acquisition function 
um, which often works right out of the box um, for these problems and for which there's a fast, flexible, um, and easy to use implementation um, made available by the, the folks who maintain Bowtorch. So yeah, let me, let me thank everybody. If you're interested in the details of uh, some of this work, you can check out these papers. Um, and I just wanna thank um, all the folks that I work with and, uh, and thank you. Thank you, Peter. That was a very thorough overview of your work on knowledge gradients. Uh, let me remind everybody that uh, yeah, the seminar is well, a few more minutes officially, but uh, uh, Peter was kind enough to offer his time uh, to stay after the seminar and uh, continue discussions and uh, in case we have detailed questions. So stick around uh, after four o'clock. Um, well, uh, let's open the floor for questions. You can raise the hand, raise your hand on the uh, uh, chat screen, or well, just sorry, can't find how to raise a hand, but I think I'll I'll you start. Can just ask. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Uh, thanks a lot Hi, for uh, th this very nice talk. Uh, I have one quick question. Um, I didn't your re your latest results. Uh, when you showed, and what gives you the head start compared to Hyperband? Because yeah. I, in my experience, Hyperband is is really good at getting results early. So I'm really curious to see how you manage to beat them. Yeah, um, let me see. <laughs> it's like the hardest thing in computer science is like figuring out multiple screens. And uh, um, yeah, so this plot here, the you know the big thing that Hyperband does is stops early um so but it you know it doesn't have any of the fanciness and sort of sophistication of the decisions about you know which hyperparameters to evaluate um that you know that are enabled by by bayesian optimization so as soon as you like include the capability to stop early then that's the thing that kind of puts you on equal footing with hyperband. And then when you add in, yeah, like kind of a sophisticated, uh, or, you know, to be honest, even like a, um, a simple acquisition function, um, you know, at that point you're, you know, you're starting to be able, you have, you know, you're in a pretty good situation to be able to beat hyperband. And then the other thing that we do is we think about, um, we think about three dimensions actually of kind of information source. So one is like how many training epochs, and that's the most important one, but, um, but also re reducing the amount of uh, training data, right? So like you can, uh, you can create like a really fast, um, you can create a fast biased information source by, tr by using, you know, one tenth or one half of the, of the training data. Um, and then you can also do some, you, you can get some performance improvement also by using less validation data, although, you know, the, the headroom, headroom in that is less. And we, you know, we think about those three different kind of, in this paper, we think about those three different controls as being con continuous knobs that you're able to tune. So, so you have three ways on acting on the time of a single experiment, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and exactly. Where the most, the two most important are number of training epochs and um, amount of training data. And really the most important one is number of training epochs because if you decide to stop um, a particular training run in the implementation that we have, we model, you know, you can go back and you can restart training from that epic like you do you know that does mean that you need to save state uh for your training runs but uh if you do that basically like kind of nothing is lost um yeah it just gives you like a lot of power to be able to optimize things thanks for sure perhaps related to that 
but I didn't quite get how is knowledge gradient. It seems like this usage of tra uh, traces that you uh, just uh, explained seems like it's orthogonal to knowledge gradients, or perhaps I missed somehow. How is it uh, combined with knowledge gradient? Right. So the way that it interacts is um, like you can build a GP that um, makes predictions for you know, validation error uh, associated with a particular set of hyperparameters, um, integrating information from traces, um, and, and information from traces is really like seeing the objective function. It's really like, if you think about a collection of inform, this is not exactly how we, how we wrote this paper. Uh, these are two separate papers, but, um, like, well, okay, actually I'll tell you that what's in the papers maybe simple enough that I can just explain directly. Like the, the statistical model in this trace paper is that there's a function um, which tells you the validation error and the training error um, as a function of the hyperparameters like you would in vanilla kind of Bayes opt auto ML. Um, also the, um, the number of training epochs, the amount of training data and the amount of validation data. Um, so the relation with knowledge gradient is that if you wanted to use ex expected improvement, then you kind of have two choices. So choice one would be that you, like what is improvement? So choice one would be improvement happens when you evaluate the actual objective function and you see actual like improvement. Um, that acquisition function would then tell you that there's no point in evaluating anything that doesn't have less than the, there, there'd be no point in evaluating anything other than the real objective because that's the only way you get improvement. So that wouldn't be a useful acquisition function. So throw that out. Another choice would be that you you pretend that the like lower fidelity objective um, is the objective function, yeah. right? And so, uh, and then you, so you get an expected improvement across hyperparameters, and then you need to come up with some other rule for figuring out which information source to use. Um, the problem with that is uh, like, first of all, what is that other rule? You know, it'd be nice to have like a principal way to do it. But second of all, you get a lot of variability in the, um, especially in the, in the training loss uh, for small amounts of validation data, um, small amounts of training data, uh, you know, where you can like overfit. Um, and it ends up being that, that that kind of assumption that the, the like low fidelity objective function is the true objective function doesn't really help you make good choices about what the, the right hyperparameters are. Um, so it means basically that if you're trying to design an acquisition function only using expected improvement, the simple things don't work and you would need to like do a lot of um, like hand whatever in order to design a good acquisition function. The real problem is that, uh, you, sh you know, like if you use the knowledge gradient, then um, that acquisition function just gives you good decisions straight out of the box because um, really what it's doing is it's valuing the information uh, on a low fidelity evaluation in terms of its ability to inform you about the quality of the real objective function. Right. Yeah, I was having in mind uh, perhaps simpler approaches like uh, Jesper Snoik, who modeled the time, for example, time that you need to evaluate the function at certain set of hyperparameters, and then you combine it in a simple way with uh, uh, the model, GP model for the objective function. And then you get some cost per second or something like that, that you then directly plug in the acquisition function. Yeah, actually we're doing that too. So we, we get like a value, um, and then the then what we we actually use is like the value per the value per um, per second of computation time. Um, the key thing is like what notion of value 
should you should you be using the, that like that yeah that mtbo we don't do comparisons with mtbo for um for this paper but yeah like um it is like a pretty good method uh you know like it outperforms this other lamb at al paper but um yeah like because it's not quantifying the value uh, in a way that is as thoughtful, you know, or like the way that it quantifies the value sort of misses um, misses a, a lot of the subtlety in terms of how um, an information source affects what you know about what you really care about, which is the objective function. Mm. Okay, thanks. For sure. Uh, I do have another quick question. Um, so regarding the one-shot knowledge gradients, um, yeah. so is this something uh, you recommend now as your default knowledge gradient policy? Um, I guess the simple answer is yes. We, we do have like other things that we're doing. Um, th there are other methods, but I didn't want to like kind of get too in the weeds ab about stuff. Um, yeah, you had sent me an email and I didn't respond. Um, yeah, like the two, the two methods that we are like recommending are this one, the one shot knowledge gradient. And then there's this other one that's, um, where we use infinitesimal perturbation analysis and the envelope theorem. And they both, you know, they both work really well. Uh, and so we're, I think like kind of in some of the stuff that we're doing now, we're sort of, um, implementing both and trying to understand like in one problem, does one work better than the other? Uh, and so, you know, yeah, like your input on that, I think would be, you know, would be interesting. Um, but yeah, we like both of those methods. But you, you don't do any more the um, approximate knowledge gradients approach is oh. much more discretized or is this still on? Yeah, no, that's a good, um, no, yeah, we like that. Okay, so that's, uh, if you're doing like vanilla, um, so certainly for just like straight ahead kind of standard Bayesian optimization, like the the one, you know, basically like if you don't have gradients and there's, if, if you don't, if it's not like a gray box problem, then then that method is, yeah, like really, yeah, it, uh, it's fast and it, yeah, works, you know, works well. So I guess in that situation, yes, we, we do recommend that one. We haven't really evaluated that, that kind of approximation in gray box problems. Um, so maybe that that's, would be an, an interesting thing to do. I'd love to know if those kinds of approximations also like give you good, kind of give you good quality at less computational cost. Cool. Uh, are there any other questions? It doesn't seem like there are. Okay. Um, well, Peter. Thanks again. Uh, we have some meetings in store, so stick around. Okay.